Right, so we're going to try to finish up photosynthesis today. And what we've been talking through is these photosystems and how those photosystems work. They're connected together through an electron transport chain. We stimulate electrons to go from ground state to excited state in these antenna chlorophyll. And eventually, we get down to this reaction center chlorophyll that donates, gets rid of its electron to the primary electron acceptor that enters into the electron transport chain and goes to the second photosystem, which is called photosystem 2. By the way, why are they called photosystem 2 and photosystem 1 instead of photosystem 1 and photosystem 2? Anyone know? Photosystem 2, even though it's the first in the photosystems, was discovered second. Photosystem 1 was discovered first. So that's just one of those little important things that sometimes happens in science. So these two photosystems, they are going to work together. So they work together. And really what happens is photons of light come in and they excite the electrons in these antenna chlorophyll, and eventually both photosystems lose their electrons. Photosystem one replaces the electron at that reaction center chlorophyll because of the donated electron that runs down the, the electron transport chain from photosystem two. Whereas the uh, reaction center chlorophyll in photosystem two is going to receive its, re its electron by breaking apart water, breaking water up into a couple protons and into oxygen and donate the electrons back into that reaction support. The photosystems can also be referred to as P680 and P700. P680 is photosystem 2, P700 is photosystem 1, and the 680 and the 700 is a reference to the wavelength nanometers, P680 responds most effectively to light in the 680 nanometer range. Photosystem 1, the P700 photosystem responds best in the 700 nanometer range, which is basically uh, kind of orange light and then red. So the P680 system. This is photosystem two. It harnesses the energy from light. Remember, light acts as both a wave and a little packet of light called a photon. And so that photon of light comes in and causes electrons in the antenna chlorophyll to transition from the ground state to their excited state. And whenever we do that, it's like jumping off an energy shell. So we increase the potential energy, and when they jump back down, they release a little energy that gets released to a neighboring electron to have that to a excited state. So eventually, after we've harnessed the light, we have electrons jumping, we have this reaction center chlorophyll, the P680 chlorophyll, that releases its electron and passes it to our PEA. Anyone remember what the P is for? Primary electron acceptor. So we reduce the primary electron acceptor. And that electron gets pulled from the primary electron acceptor into the electron transport chain due to increasing electronegativity as we move through the electron transport. Now, as this chlorophyll passes off its electron, it would be reducer oxidized. So the electron jumps from the reaction center chlorophyll up to the primary electron acceptor. So it is. because we're losing the electron. So 
So that chlorophyll is oxidized, and that means that we need a new electron. And we need that new electron to get back to ground state. So that whole chlorophyll, when it loses its electron, is in a state it doesn't want, it doesn't want to be in. So we want to get an electron back in to move it back down to its ground state. Photosystem 2 is where the water comes in. We need water for photosynthesis. This is where the water molecule is used. Now, water molecules are basically oxygens, protons, and electrons. So atoms of oxygen, and then the hydrogens are going to be protons, and then there's some electrons in there as well. So we can break apart water, and we can liberate electrons. So we split the water. This is an enzymatically catalyzed reaction. And as we do this, this is to provide the electron. So we're left over with some oxygen and a couple of protons, and then the electron gets passed into that reaction center chlorophyll where it was lost. So we reduce the oxidized chlorophyll back down to its ground state. Now, if you look at it, the reaction shows one half O2. So really what's happening with this reaction is we're just producing one atom of oxygen. So we produce two protons and one atom of oxygen. Well, atomic oxygen is actually made up of two oxygen atoms with a double covalent bond. We only have half of that right now. We only have one of the O's. So on the next reaction, which happens basically almost instantaneously, we generate a second oxygen. So each time we go through this breakup of water, two protons and one oxygen atom. And then that oxygen atom, it quickly associates with another oxygen atom. And that yields our atomic oxygen, O2, which is what humans require and other organisms require for cellular respiration. And that makes its way out of the, the leaf or out of the photosynthetic bacteria and into the environment. Now, when we break up the water, the electron is associated with the hydrogen. And so the hydrogen initially, for a split second, is basically neutral hydrogen. No, no neutrons in hydrogen, right? It's just an electron and a proton. Well, electrons, and, or the uh, hydrogen is not very good at holding on to those electrons, especially if there's a more electronegative molecule nearby. So when that hydrogen is produced through this reaction of rain and water, that hydrogen can no longer effectively hold the electron. And so those electrons are going to jump up to that chlorophyll to re-reduce or to reduce the electron. So that's this whole part of the reaction right here. Photons excite electrons to go from ground to excited, and as they slip back down to ground, that energy gets passed to a neighboring chlorophyll, and we go through that whole process until we pump an electron to the primary electron acceptor. Water is enzymatically broken down. A O is produced, and hydrogen is carrying the electrons. They lose their electrons to replace the electron that is lost. This happens over and over and over. Doing all right there, Hannah? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out if there's um, H plus can no longer hold. hold. I guess it should be no longer hold. Yeah. It no longer holds the electron, and so it passes it to that chlorophyll that's yeah. oxidized. And so it reduces that oxidized chlorophyll. This guy right here.
Now, it's the primary electron acceptor that picks up the electron that's lost from the reaction center floor. And that electron, it just simply gets passed through the primary electron acceptor to the electron transport chain. And in the membrane, remember that this is this is inside of inside of the thylakoid system where all of this is happening. So we're talking about this stuff right in here. Okay? So you'll notice that we have a series of proteins that are that make up this electron transport chain. There are going to be four members. that make up this electron transport chain. They are referred to as PQ, SIP, which is a complex, there we go, made up of two proteins, and then PC. So this is a complex of two proteins, and then we have PQ and, P, and, and PC. So the electron goes from PC to the uh, SIP complex, this just simply stands for cytochrome P, to PC, and then gets delivered to the P700. This is PQ. So the that we're looking at right there is what happens before it gets to the electron transport chain, or that's in the. This electron. is the electron transport chain right here. Okay. This is photosystem one. We excite the electrons here at the reaction center. That electron literally it leaves. It's no longer associated with this molecule, and it, it gets picked up by the primary electron acceptor. Then, because of electronegativity, that electron wants to move into the electron transport chain, and it gets passed through that electron transport chain. And as we go through those complexes of the electron transport chain, eventually we make our way to photosystem one and the P700 reaction center core. So as you go from photosystem two through the electron transport chain to photosystem one, each step along the way is an increase in electronegativity. So it's going to be that increase in electronegativity that pulls the electron down or along that electron transport chain. And that's basically what's happening in the mitochondria with cellular respiration. Is because of increasing electronegativity towards oxygen that we're moving that electron along. Now, as we go through that electron transport chain, notice that as the electron moves through and we end up over here at photosystem one we have hydrogens that are being pumped through into the thylakoid loop. So from the chloroplast, the stroma, the liquid of the chloroplast, hydrogens are being pumped into the thylakoid loop and across that membrane. Okay? But as the concentration of hydrogen increases in the lumen, it's coupled to ATP synthase. So just the same way we, that we saw the cellular respiration, those hydrogens move through and cause the catalytic knob to rotate in order to produce ATP molecules. Does that make sense? Everybody following you? So we can have this phosphorylation of ATP as the electrons move through the electron transport chain and pump hydrogens into the thylakoid lumen, those hydrogens form a proton motive force.
that then can be utilized by ATP synthase to make ATP. At the very end of the electron transport system is going to be photosystem one, our second photosystem. That's also going to interact with light. And as it interacts with light, you have those electrons that jump around. And eventually, we're going to have an electron at the reaction center chlorophyll be released to the primary electron acceptor. It has to be replaced. It's being replaced by the electron as it comes off the end of the electron transport. Is everybody pretty much following me with what's going on here? Okay, so this is the P700 system, also known as photosystem number one. Same thing's going to happen in the P700 system. Light, little packet or photon of light comes in, begins to excite chlorophyll electrons. They go from ground state to excited state. And then as they slip back down to the ground state, they release a little bit of that chemical energy. It causes neighboring electrons to jump up from ground state to like uh, excited state. So the light is going to promote an electron from P700, the, the reaction center chlorophyll, to jump to the primary electron acceptor. So now that chlorophyll is going to be oxidized. When that reaction center chlorophyll is oxidized, that means that it's in its excited state. And what do we want to do if we're in the excited state? Back to the ground. And the only way we can get back to the ground is if we reduce that oxidized chlorophyll. So we need an electron. And that electron is coming from the electron transport chain. So it splits the water, jumps up to P700, then that's electrons excited to go to the primary electron uh, or to the primary electron acceptor, enters into the increasingly electronegative electron transport chain, causing hydrogens to cross through into the lumen, and then jumps onto the P700 that has been oxidized, so it reduces that P700 chlorophyll to get it back down to ground state. So in order to reduce that oxidized chlorophyll for photosystem 1, P700, the electron incoming from the electron transport chain leading away from photo system number two. Okay? Everybody see how it's all connected up here? We literally are taking an oxygen, uh, I'm sorry, electron from water, moving it through increasing electronegativity until eventually we're going to dump it out to be able to pick, be picked up by this NADP to convert it into NADPH, which is an electron shuffle. Now, we do have this second electron transport chain after photosystem one. We have a molecule there called ferredox. And as that P700 electron is excited, it jumps to the primary electron acceptor, it gets passed from the primary electron acceptor to this ferredoxin because of even a bigger increase in, a further increase in electronegativity. So the electron jumps here now to ferredoxin. Ferredoxin 
is now in a reduced state, and it's going to be oxidized in the presence of NAD plus to form NAD pH. So ferredoxin in the presence of this enzyme called NADP, NADP plus reductase loses its electron. So we oxidize the ferredox, ferredoxin, ferredoxin to reduce the NAD plus to NADPH, passing the electron onto that particular molecule. So the whole net result here of this photo portion of photosynthesis is to generate ATP, which is being generated by the proton motive force. Okay, so as the electron moves through from photosystem two to photosystem one, we pump hydrogens through those hydrogens then travel through ATP synthase to generate ATP. Then the last electron, or the electron, is finally pushed onto ferredoxin. And in the presence of NADP plus reductase, the enzyme strips the electron from ferredoxin and puts it onto NADP plus to form NADPH. So we end up with ATP molecules and NADPH molecules. Now, what you need to think about here is we end up with a little bit of energy, and we end up with some electrons. So we got a little energy, and we got some electrons. Those are the final products of the photo portion of photosynthesis. The energy in ATP and the electrons bound up on the NADPH are going to be passed to the Kelvin cycle, which is going to be the synthesis portion of photosynthesis. Did this all just happen to the fast? Yep, all this happened in the membrane of the thyroid. Okay, so here is sort of the, the summary of the photo portion of photosynthesis into the synthesis portion. So you're going to have those electrons that are moved through because the electrons are being excited and you lose electrons two electron transport chains eventually to produce NADH, okay? Pumping the hydrogens through. Generating NADH and generating ATP. Both the NADPH and the ATP are captured up in the stroma of the chlor uh, chloroplast. And they go into this thing called the Kelvin cycle, which is a cycle of reactions, where we are gonna have production of carbon-based molecules. All right, so photo, you have everything that's going on there. Electron transport chains, photo systems, electron transport, ground states, the excited state within chlorophyll pigment molecules, the interaction between the reaction center chlorophyll and the primary electron, uh, primary electron acceptor, the intervening electron transport chains, the movement of electrons from water to NADPH, the production of ATP and the proton more force. All of that is the photo portion, the photo reaction of photosynthesis. The synthesis reaction is better known as the Kelvin cycle. Okay. 
right, so here's a picture of the Kelvin cycle. Notice that the light reaction occurs in the thylakoid. The Kelvin cycle is going to occur in the stroma of the chlorophyll. Now it's a cycle, and this cyclical pattern is similar to the Krebs cycle that we saw with cellular respiration. Cyclical, just like Krebs cycle. Now, this is another place where basically it's going to be beneficial if you, you can sort of generate the basic skeleton of what's happening and figure out where things are being utilized and where things are being produced, and then go back in and begin to think about the specific steps, the specific reactions that occur. So, I'm going to give you some very brief details. And then based off of these very brief details that I give you, you need to go in and you need to do that with the Kelvin cycle as well. So you should be doing battle with the glycolytic pathway, you should be doing battle with the Krebs cycle, battle with both uh, the electron transport chain and photos, the uh, photo systems, and then battle here with the Kelvin cycle. So overall, if we just sort of draw a circle, that's going to be our cycle, and then that circle is broken up into three different phases. In each of those phases, there's something going on in each of those phases. Phase number one is called carbon fixation. Okay, so carbon fixation. Our raw ingredient for carbon fixation is going to be a carbon source. This is where the CO2 is going to come in. So you breathe out CO2, it gets picked up by photosynthetic organisms like plants and bacteria, photosynthetic bacteria. They use the carbon dioxide in this carbon fixation portion of the Kelvin cycle. The end of the Kelvin cycle produces this sugar called ribulose, this phosphate, RUBP. It is a five carbon molecule that has a phosphate on either end. That five carbon molecule combines enzymatically with the carbon from carbon dioxide to generate this molecule called rubisco. This is a short lived six carbon intermediate that eventually is broken down into three phosphoglycerin. Okay? So we go from five carbons, we add one on, and then we split it to get six three carbon molecules. So this is all during our fixation step, or carbon fixation phase. Phase number two is going to be our reduction phase. Now during reduction, Really think about what is reduction. <coughs> what happens when we reduce something? Okay, we add an electron, which reduces our charge on the molecule. So during reduction, we are going to be adding electrons. What do you think I'm going to use as my source for electrons? Where did I just produce electrons? I produce the electrons at the end of my electron transport chain during the photo reaction by generating what molecules. Come on, you know this. The photosynthetic version of NADH. NADPH. So I'm going to have NADPHs come in that are going to give up their electrons to be regenerated as NADP+. So during reduction, we are adding to our three carbon, three phosphoglycerate, high energy electrons, and also some inorganic phos phosphates to the substrate. Where am I getting those inorganic phosphates? Or 
am I going to get a phosphate? What molecules do I have? What molecules am I producing? Okay, I got the NADPH. What am I producing here with ATP synthase? ATP. I'm going to use ATP as my provider of my inorganic phosphate. I'm going to use my NADPH as the provider of my electron synthesis reduction states. And so I go from, by the way, does anyone recognize 3 phosphoglycerate? Or how about 1 3 bis phosphoglycerate? Or how about glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate? Give me a hint, take a look at the glycolytic pathway. G3P is that what leads into that sixth step of, of the glycolytic pathway. It's a three carbon sugar that we take the rest of the way through the glycolytic pathway to produce hydrogen. So we're using some energy and in inorganic phosphates, and we're using electrons from our NADPH molecules to basically generate a free carbon molecule that fits right into the middle of the glycolytic pathway. That is going to be outputted from the Kelvin cycle here at the end of the reduction phase. And we're actually going to lose, so if you go through and you count here, over here our ribulose bisphosphate, there are three molecules of ribulose bisphosphate times the five molecules of carbon, or five atoms of carbon in, in each molecule. That's a total of 15 carbons. Those 15 carbons combine with three carbons from carbon dioxide. So if I have 15 carbons and I have three more carbons in, how many carbons do I have now? Three plus 15. 18 carbons. If you take a look here, I have three molecules that contain six carbons. How many carbons is that? Three times six. 18. I take those three six carbon molecules and I divide them in half, how many molecules should I have? And how many carbons in each molecule? I start off with three molecules containing 18. I divide them in half. I'm going to have six molecules with three carbons. So I've got my 18 my 18 carbons. Do you see where this is kind of going? Keep track of the carbons, and you're gonna you're gonna really get ahead up on the Kelvin cycle. See here, I have six molecules of three carbons each. Then I add in another phosphate because I've taken the phosphate from the ATP, and now I have a group of six three carbon molecules with phosphates on either end. Now I get down here to Glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, we strip off one of the phosphates. I still have six three carbon molecules. I'm going to shuttle one of them out of the Krebs, out of their Kelvin cycle. So that's just one three carbon molecule that's being removed. I have how many G3Ps after I remove the one? I had six to start with, I removed one. Five. Each of them has three carbons. How many total carbons do I have? Five times three, 15. Those 15 carbons are going to interact with some more energy, ATP, in this final stage here, which is going to be the regeneration of the COT, the, the carbon dioxide acceptor. So my five G3Ps, how many, how many carbons? 15 total carbons. I produce three ribulose bisphosphates. Each molecule has five. I'm maintaining now 15 carbons. So keep track of the carbons as you go through here. I have three that come in at the top and three carbons that leave at the bottom. And so I fluctuate on this side 18 carbons and on this side 15 carbons. The math is lost on all of you. Okay, so phase number three here. 
we've just released one of our D3Ps. So now I have 15 carbons. So those five three carbon G3Ps, the 15 carbons, interact with some ATP to generate ribulose bis phosphate. So at this step, we're really regenerating our starting product, which is a carbon acceptor or a carbon dioxide acceptor. So phase three is to regenerate that starting product. I want to regenerate my six carbon molecule called Nubisco. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to take my G3Ps and I'm going to reorganize them enzymatically in the presence of ATPs to generate three five carbon molecules called ribulose bisphosphate. And then that ribulose bisphosphate, which is a five carbon molecule, is going to accept the CO2 from the carbon dioxide to regenerate a six carbon molecule called Nubisco, which then goes through the transfer of inorganic phosphate, the transfer of electrons to generate my G3P. And one of those G3P can be slipped off at the bottom. So three carbons come in at the top, three carbons leave at the bottom of the drop These three carbon G3P molecules, they go to a secondary enzymatic pathway that basically is the reverse of glycolysis that puts the, the three the, the G3Ps together to form by glucose molecule. Carbon fixation stops once we have the short-lived intermediate that gets converted into three carbon molecules. Carbon fixation is taking the ribulose bisphosphate, which is five carbons. There are three of those, three five carbon molecules. Each accepts a carbon from a carbon dioxide. That's the carbon fixation step. That molecule will be fixed with the carbon to form this short-lived intermediate that has five carbons. That splits into six three carbon three phosphoglycerates. Then we add in the ATP to form one three bis phosphoglycerate, add in the electrons which reorganizes everything into glyceraldehyde three phosphate. And it's that G3P. How many G3Ps do I lose each cycle of the Calvin cycle? One. That G3P each glyceraldehyde three phosphate going to go and be used to produce new glucose. And remember, this is the same sugar, three carbon sugar, that's in the middle of the glycolysis. And it's going to be shuttled off to uh, another biochemical pathway. other sugars, including glucose, but also to be incorporated into starch, which is the storage, uh, storage molecule in the plants, sucrose, the disaccharide, and others. And then you consume that leafy vegetable or another plant and those starches and those sucroses are being stored in there. You break them up, break those out, homogenize those out of the food, and you can now consume that thing because that's like a glycolic pathway. Mm -hmm.
Okay, has everybody got all of this? What questions do we have on photosynthesis? How many carbon dioxides do we have come in in the Kelvin cycle? Three. And those carbon dioxides carry how many carbons? One each, so a total of three carbons. They combine with that end product called ribulose bisphosphate, RUBP. How many carbons does each molecule of ribulose bisphosphate have? Five. How many total carbons are associated between the three RUBPs on in, in the Kelvin cycle? Fifteen. So if you look at that carbon cycle or that Kelvin cycle, on the left hand side, fifteen carbons. On the right hand side, eighteen carbons. At the top, the carbons come in. At the bottom, the carbons go off. Okay, so we go from 15 carbons, add three more, we have 18 carbons, then we break them up with ATP and NADH, 18 carbons, 18 carbons, 18 carbons, one comes out, 15 carbons here, one carbon here, 18 carbons here, those 15 carbons are reorganized into three five carbon molecules, still 15 carbons, we get three more carbons back in, we get 18, right, so 18 on this side, 15 on this side, Three come in, three go off. Generating G3P, because G3P is a sugar that can be used to build a variety of different saccharides and polysaccharides and disaccharides and nitrous. So is this no longer 15, there's one right? The Rubisco, there's now going to be three of those, each containing six, so there's 18. Because you have the three that come in to combine with the 15 from the ribulose bisphosphate. What other questions? Do we have questions about our life reaction? Photosynthesis, we divide the photo, and we call that the light-dependent reaction, and the Kelvin cycle is the light-independent reaction. Why is it light-independent? It doesn't require any light. I require carbon dioxide. Where am I getting the carbon dioxide? Where does the carbon dioxide come The air. And how does it get into a leaf? Through the stoma. Enters into the chlorophyll. And it's used there at the top of the Kelvin cycle. I also need oxygen and I need water. I'm sorry, I need water and I produce oxygen. But where do I get the water from? Yeah, so from a tree, I bring it up from the roots and distribute it into the leaves. Photosynthetic bacteria will pull it into their membrane. Still need all those raw nutrients. I need carbon dioxide and I need the water. The CO2 is, is consumed in the Kelvin cycle. The oxygen is produced in the light dependent cycle during the photo reaction. Okay? So hopefully you're beginning to dissect all of these provisional cycles, glycolytic pathway, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, lactate and ethanol fermentation, and then photosynthesis, both the light-dependent and the light-independent reactions you need to know. Start out with the big overall view. If you can draw, if you can draw this, a circle, and you can put three carbons, three carbons leaving, 18 carbons, and 15 carbons, 
That's like 50% of the way there. And then you start adding in the specific products for first, then, then add in where the ATP and the NATPH is and the ATPs are being consumed. Now you're at a 70 or 80%. And then add in the specific substrates and where it's happening. It's happening in the stroma of the chloroplast, uh, 100%. Okay? Does any other questions as you're getting ready to head out today? All right. I'll see you next. I'll see you on Wednesday.